because every time we provide more access to students, then the, the tuition and fees, improvement board things rise along with that, uh, and the, the access problem persists. We don't ever get rid of the access problem because of an early inability to control those costs. All right, uh, the, the other thing here, the last two things here, is now what we, would, what we would normally say in a circumstance like this and what you would hear people say anyway, uh, is that, well, what we need to do is just get the public to provide more public support for higher education at all levels, both public and private. Well, there's a problem with that. Because the states are facing very serious increases in Medicaid costs, prison costs, and in particular unfunded pension liabilities, along with a, another very large laundry list of items that are a problem for the states. And then the third thing, the last thing here about, it, about those government problems is it's a global sovereign debt problem. The federal government has, um, has uncovered liabilities that are enormous in, uh, in, the, uh, uh, in the treatment for non a lot of the entitlement programs. Here again, I'm 70 years old, I'm part of that problem. But I'm here to tell you that I've been talking to my students about this issue for, for 20 years. I warned them and nobody ever took me serious because the, uh, because the simple algebra involved in the number of uh, those individuals who are receiving support versus the denominator, the number of people contributing toward that support uh, kept getting worse and worse every year and it will get even worse more fa faster, more faster, that's not a word, uh, later on. Okay, so the, the algebra doesn't work uh, and the, all the other obligations here are going to continue to eat up uh, any uh, surpluses that may, may arise in the federal, at the federal level. So, we're not going to be able to look to governments for support or increasing support to these issues. Now, the next question. You might say, and you can say, yes, I, again, I was thinking this very thing, maybe what's happening is that all of those real costs we've observed uh, going into higher education are actually really important investments in higher education quality. Now, I can tell you for the last 20 years that the sum of that investment across the board is in excess of half a trillion dollars. So if it is all quality investment, man, there really ought to be some kind of payback for uh, you know, over half a trillion dollars in the, in the past 15 years. Uh, 15 to 20 years for this. Now, overall, I'll tell you that I look and I've never heard anybody making the case uh, for higher education that the quality of undergraduate instruction has actually increased during this period. Nobody makes that case, right? But there are a lot of objective indicators that suggest we've got problems in terms of maintaining quality in uh, in. Uh, in undergraduate instruction in particular. I don't think it's necessarily true so much in graduate education because many of the research institutions have been very focused on graduate education but not as focused on undergraduate education. First of all, the reasons why you might conclude that graduation, that, excuse me, that quality is not, or evaluated is not improved, is to do with graduation rates that have been declining. You know, there's been a secular decline in the, in the, the number of students, proportion of students who actually graduate in four years for the past four decades, all right? Another really important one here is the problem with grade inflation. Grade inflation continues. Now, what this looks like, if you actually go to the data on grade inflation, is you, you find that the, the median grade has been stepping up, you know, from, from a C minus uh, into the B's, into the mid B's, and into the upper B's, that's the median grade, moving progressively closer to an A or an A minus. At the same time that that's been going on, the distribution has been, the probability mass has been collapsing on the median. All right? So it's become much more condensed uh, uh, distribution as, uh, as it has moved up. Okay? Now, you all know your statistics because you're all scientists, and you know the more variation you have in something, the more information you have, right? You all know that, all right? When you've got something where all the probability mass is stacked on one, uh, on one item, you've got 
an identity of some sort uh, in your model someplace. Um, and the point that remember about grade inflation is grades are supposed to be a labor market signal, right? They are supposed to signal to prospective employees where this person might stand within a distribution, a known distribution. But if that distribution collapses on an all A minus uh, kind of thing, there's no information to be extracted from that. Now this explains why the way you get a job has changed so dramatically, all right? And that is you don't do it anymore on the basis of your grade point. You can't even really do it on your, your rank of where you are in, uh, in your class when you graduate, whether you're number 100, 102, or 30, 35, whatever the case may be. Because the differences there in terms of the actual grades are so minute that they don't really mean a lot in terms of your class ranking, all right? So what happens? Well, employers say, what we're going to do is we're going to start uh, screening people by using uh, internships, all right? And so what they're doing in that case is they're asking you to come on board and say, show me something. Show me why I should make you a permanent employee. So if you get an internship at a place you'd like to go to work for, do your dead level best to exceed expectations because that's the way you get and hold a job, all right? So the, the grade and the class rank are not carrying as much information as it used to, all right? So they, they've gone to some all different ways. The other thing is the secular studies of the amount of time per week that students study has gone down dramatically from the 60s to the present. People just don't put in the effort uh, and time and studying. Uh, students don't as they used to. The fourth thing is proficiency tests are getting worse. And this is measured by uh, critical thinking skills and also by uh, things like adult numeracy and adult uh, literacy uh, kinds of uh, uh, tests that go on. And those have been in secular decline as well. Yes? Can I ask a question? So what you said about student study time, is there any research that shows that that's declined because of the additional hours students have had to work to pay for the high rising cost of higher education? Uh, you know, that's a good question. And I don't know that literature that well uh, to whether I can tell you uh, the definitive answer whether that variable is significant or not. I suspect it probably is. Uh, I think one of the things that is, uh, is, um, is explains, the, um, uh, explains the great inflation problem it is this mutual uh, uh, agreement, uh, mutual non-aggression pact between, between professors and between students. Uh, uh, I, you know, I'll give you good grades if you'll just simply give me good, you know, good evaluations. Another aspect of that I want to point out here, with that working, Think what that does to uh, individual professors who are really trying to maintain standards. So it's kind of what we refer to in economics as Gresham's Law of Teaching, and that is uh, people who do that drive out good teaching because uh, what you get from students, if you're really holding their feet to the fire in your class, is you get to come in and say, well, you are so unreasonable by comparison to Professor X. And you get that time and time again from students and that uh, will erode your willingness and your ability. If you're trying to get tenure, that's a big problem. If you're already tenured, it's not a big, big problem, but uh, it is. Now, one of the last things here is who is the deconstruction of the corporation. Now, what I mean by this, I'll just use an example of uh, uh, what's been happening for the past uh, 40, 40 years in my own profession. There is a very well understood paradigm in economics. It rests on a series of uh, uh, theoretical courses that you have to master after you've had the introductory course uh, in, uh, in economics, the principles course. And that's usually a two semester uh, course at most institutions. Then there's the uh, next course in the sequence there, is micro and macroeconomics. Now, those courses used to be prerequisites for virtually everything else you took. But that has eroded dramatically in the economics profession where people keep making exceptions for students to be taking classes that they really should not be taking because they do not have the foundation in the theory courses. Or they don't also have the foundation in the, in the staff course, to be taking that course, for instance. 
And that undermines quality uh, itself by deconstructing the, the, uh, uh, the core courses like that. All right. Now, this is my most important slide. All right. This is where it all comes together. Uh, this identifies the four separate cost drivers, the things that drive costs higher in higher education. And it also identifies the two separate origins, you know, where they come from, you know, what vector are they on? Uh, are these things coming from the outside or are these things internal? And that's the, dis the, the distinction between the, uh, uh, the external source and the internal source. And they're divided basically into four things, like I said. And the number one thing is government mandates. Not, not, not necessarily number one in terms of rank or size or influence or anything like that, but the first one is the government mandate. This is a problem that every, every institution, whether it's for-profit, non-profit, whatever, government, whatever it is, uh, it, it suffers from. Because the governments at all levels do place unfunded mandates on these institutions. Um, I would point out to you, however, that, that the for-profit firms are scrutinized 